sustainable living, finding a balance or a synergy between our inner and outer ecology. Two decades ago, before I was born, my father, who was a businessman in Mumbai, decided to leave and come and live in Panchkani, a small hit station in the western Ghats of India. He would regularly cycle from Panchkani to Mahabaleshwar, which was 12 miles away. And there he was fascinated by a lake. And he created a livelihood around the lake. And so when I was born, two decades later, this was my home and the home of my siblings, my three brothers. One of them is still living, and he lives in Panchgani, 82 years old, and doing very well close to nature. So when I was 18, and my dear friend Peter put a proposition to me, he said, he wrote, actually, on a piece of paper. He said, would you like to be the wife of a poultry farmer or an academic in the US, which he wrote on the flip side. And I said, let's go for farming. And he said, done. See, Peter was a brilliant man. He had just scored first class first in Delhi University in his master's degree and had great prospects opening up to him. Anyway, we decided to go for farming. And we bought this two-acre plot of land, which was extremely rugged, very slopy. In fact, it used to be constantly burnt by the local population. It was a kind of a practice called vanva, so that the grasses grow evenly. Um, and you can imagine starting off with borrowed capital, not much of a plan with us, we faced a lot of challenges. And there was a great amount of churning that happened, and internal seeking as to where we are going and what is it we are doing. And as we often have experienced, all challenges bring for us hidden gifts. And the hidden gift here for me was that I came across this gem. This gem, which was at the Yoga Institute in Mumbai. I came across a way of life that was holistic, that talked about the synergy between our outer selves, our bodies, our spirit, and our mind. And this made a huge, made the world's impact on me. And our then teacher, Dr. Jaidev, who was my great inspiration and has remained so, he's late Dr. Jaidev, and his wife, Hansa Bain, still is there. She's taken the institute to great heights. Dr. Jaidev had a way, a beautiful way to distill, with four points that I remember, the essence of yoga in action, or karma yoga. You would say, work without ego, with full concentration, not looking for the fruits of the action, and dedicate your work to something higher than yourself. Now this made the greatest impact for me on what we are trying to describe as my inner ecology. And with this, I went back to a renewed view and perspective towards the land, my relationships, and my family. And to demonstrate how this manifested, I will share a few examples. So my daughter, older daughter, she is looking after a forest in southern India. And right now, there's an intense struggle to save this forest. And she tells me, Mama, when I face the greatest of challenges, all I have to do is remember the landscape of the farm. And she says, Mama, that makes me feel at peace together and whole. And I feel 
very grateful for that because as a mother, I am concerned. But I'm also grateful because the landscape, the outer ecology which she experienced as a child has hold her, held her in good step today in her inner, the landscape of her mind. And that has built a resilience. My younger daughter, she lives in Pune, she's here today, and she studied yoga at the same institute. She has no ambitions at all of joining, of doing, of any career. She just is happy to teach yoga. Right now her passion is cycling, and though it's a bit concerning, she says, Mama, cycling is a is I mean, it creates mindfulness, especially with traffic and all. You have to be so alert and mindful. And she says, I want to make a difference in the world, but first I need to understand myself. And that is what she's pursuing, teaching and learning through yoga. So what is it we did on this two-acre barren bit of land over 50 years? How did we work towards ecological integrity? As I first shared, it was always every year there was a practice till today of the neighboring village people of burning the land so that the fodder grew easily and evenly. And this was an alarming kind of a practice. But when you face challenges or you face a different way of doing things, one way of tackling it is getting into the shoes of those who are doing it. And so I said, though it was quite daunting, I said, we must have some cows. And I got two cows, and I still have two cows. Of course, they were, they were different from the ones we got then. And they have been a great boon because though we are vegan now, we don't take out the milk, but we get the cow dung and urine, which makes a beautiful jiva brood, uh, a mixture, which is very beneficial to the soil. And so with the possibilities of remain totally organic and not using chemicals are very good. We even share this with our neighboring farmers. Of course, as you would expect, we grew trees, we have a food forest, and as we know, forests sequester carbon in the soil, and they sequester water in the soil. And we would we built swales around which we planted trees, and these became very good windbreakers. <coughs> these food forests have been become a habitat for birds, insects, bees. We get hives of bees, many hives of bees in summer, and we do not extract the honey. Our intention is that we would like to create a habitat for the biodiversity, for the diversity of in insects and other species which are beneficial. Now, one of the things that has been troublesome is that strawberries <coughs> is the cash crop of this area. Mahabaleshwar is known to be a place where beautiful strawberries grow. We used to have a variety that was extremely hardy. When India got liberalized, an American variety came in. And this, a Californian variety, and this brought an amazing amount of diseases into the, uh, the, uh, into the whole area. And the farmers started spraying huge amounts of chemicals that till today, strawberries top the list of dirty dozen of toxic fruit. And we decided we are not planting strawberries. But somewhere we did do a few for a few years to be able to see, could we do this organically in spite of all the problems? And we were successful, and I've been able to convert some, one of the big-time farmers to growing strawberries organically, and support him in several ways, including 
uh, marketing and mentoring him. And so um, we, we are very careful about growing food crops today. We have decided that we do not wish to use scarce resources for fruits and for anything where we cut flowers or fruits for just for the market. Because food is the need of the hour. Healthy food, food that is free of toxins. So we grow medicinal plants. There's a big focus on that. Bryophyllum, Neroli phalanthus, these are the ones that are extremely good for different parts of our body, the gallbladder or the kidney stone. And I would like to share that in COVID, we have been completely medicine-free. That it is this natural way of living which has held us in extremely good stead. Now, a habitat like this is a beautiful place for children to grow up. So we've been running eco camps and we've had over these 50 years, we've had at least 25,000 students come to our camps from schools from Mumbai, Pune, and some have even come from the Netherlands and other overseas. We also ran a home school and this school was based with nature as the hub for learning. And there was no planned curriculum. The curriculum came from the children's interest and it evolved spontaneously. But the children covered a lot of what is covered in our textbooks and more. This is what the children said after some years when they went to other schools, because we ran this for three years, and they said all that we are uh, now learning is already covered. So I'll give you two instances of our experiences there. There is one student who would have very low feelings. From time to time, she would get into what I could think of maybe as a depression, or she would be low. And I would say, let's go into the field. And then she would put her hands into the soil and we'd work. And let me tell you, in half an hour, she would say, I'm feeling much better. <coughs> Do you know that soil has a happy chemical, serotonin, which is the chemical used in antidepressants. So here's an example of how soil is directly related, which is an outer part of our ecology, is directly connected to the state of mind of this girl. And there was another incident of an, another girl who came to, to us, and when she first came, she had a great phobia for writing. She didn't want to write. So when others would be writing their diaries, she would, we would let her be, and she would go out in the countryside. And after some months, she started writing and wrote the script for a video play that she created in the school. And many years later, she tells me, and so did her parents, that she has developed the greatest passion for writing. And this was developed at Redstone, for which she is very grateful. Now, a place like this attracts a lot of tourists. It's a tourist hub. Panchkani, Mahabaleshwar, is some place where we get throngs of tourists. And it really is very saddening to see what tourism is doing to this place. It is an extremely uh, vulnerable ecosystem. We are supposed to be an eco-sensitive zone. So we do entertain guests at our place. We run a homestay. But we made it very clear right from the beginning that this is a very rustic place. Of course, rustic is a very 
uh, is an extremely romantic term. So we explain that the washrooms are not attached, uh, some walls are plastered with cow dung and mud. And we go, we make it clear that this is not a fancy resort. And this is not for the overpriced areas. And yet somehow we had a lot of people coming and they've had a very satisfactory stay. They've written beautiful reviews and because we take them on a farm tour and then uh, they, they have actually been very impacted by it. And that's how I'm here because uh, one of my guests, as it was an alumni of this college, uh, was quite taken, about, uh, taken up by it and invited me to speak here. So to wind up, I'm trying to give you some kind of instances where our inner and outer ecology are inextricably linked. But today, climate scientists say that this is the end. This, there is no returning. We are on a suicidal trajectory. And that's talking about our outer environment. But what about our inner environment? Can we change that? That's what we can impact, our fears, our greed. Can we work on ourselves? Can we think of a critical mass of people looking towards working without ego, with dedicating their work to something higher than themselves, with compassion and insight? Yes, what if we never know how things will pan out?